Okay, we're going live on Facebook now. And Manu, how are you doing? Let me make you a co-host again so you can share your screen. Okay, looks like Manu's having a, um, some tech issues. Um, is there a phone you could join in with, Manu? Maybe you can join by phone if that would be, um, if that's possible for you. Um, Feel free to chat me. It is 5.01, so I'm going to go ahead and start the webinar. Okay, attendees are coming in. Aloha, everyone. Welcome. We'll just get started in a few minutes. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. Nothing like a Zoom webinar without tech issues, right? <laughs> okay, hi everyone. I see that more people are joining in. We'll just get started in about one minute. All right, shall we get started? Okay, hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Connie, I am the Development Director of Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice. And thank you for taking time out of your evening, your Monday evening to join us um, for a screening of Rooted to Our Land, a film that shares some perspective on the affordable housing barriers facing the native Hawaiian community. This film was produced by Hawaii Appleseed and created in partnership with Professor Williamson Chang, who teaches at UH Manoa Richardson School of Law and made into fruition by Appleseed summer intern, Abby Seitz, who will be leading our discussion today. We're super grateful to our featured panelists um, who are here with us today. Thank you so much everyone for taking time out of your schedule. Dr. Manulani Meyer, Dr. Philip Garboden, Geraldine Johnston, Kailani Meheula, and Professor Williamson Chang. Before I hand it off to Abby, I wanted to share some background on Hawaii Appleseed and why we helped make this film. For those of you who may not be familiar with our nonprofit, much of our work at Appleseed is focused on data-driven information and research to inform and facilitate systems change that will increase economic security for our working families here in Hawaii. One of our focus areas is affordable housing, 
including understanding the barriers our communities face and accessing it so we can do our part and advocate for change at the government and policy level. As our team researched the possibilities of contributing state lands for housing, it became clear that any policy involving state lands needs to consider the state obligation toward housing for Native Hawaiians, the Indigenous people of our land. This video is an attempt to share some of what we have been learning that is hard to capture in charts and graphs. And our Artists for Appleseed event seemed like a good time to share it. You can learn more about Artists for Appleseed by visiting artists for the number four, appleseed.com. Thanks again for your time this evening. After the screening, we will be joined by our panelists for a deeper discussion on the issues shared in the video. If you have questions at any time during the event, feel free to drop it into the Q&A box so we can all see it. I also want to acknowledge that today is Indigenous Peoples Day. So thank you to all of you who made the time to be with us. I'm now gonna hand it off to Abby. Abby? Thanks, Connie. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Abby Seitz. I'm a community and urban planner here in Honolulu, and I recently began studying human rights law, which uh, brought me to working with Appleseed this summer. Uh, before I jump in, I wanted to say mahalo nui to Appleseed for hosting the virtual event, um, our wonderful panelists for joining us, and as well as all, all of our attendees. We've been really blown away at how many RSVPs we got to this event, and we're really grateful that so many folks are interested in this topic. To give a little background on the film, as Connie mentioned, I'm part of a team at Appleseed studying how affordable housing can be built on state lands. As part of the study, we're looking at opportunities to prioritize Native Hawaiians. Um, and as we were making the traditional studies and report, we also felt a need to look at more creative ways to engage people on this important topic. And so at the direction of Professor Chang, we decided to create a film. Although I'm not a videographer or a filmmaker by any means, um, I'm lucky to know a lot of very talented people and change makers in the community who help make this film possible. So through a process of reaching out to different stakeholders, holding interviews and intervie um, filming different parts of the island, we ended up with a short film that shows five perspectives on why it's so important to prioritize native Hawaiians in housing on their own homeland. This is clearly a very high level approach to a very complicated topic, but I think each person we included in this film has a really important story to tell and I'm excited to share it with you tonight. So with that, I'm gonna share with my screen. I'll start the film and that will run about 10 minutes. When I started um, searching deep, I was um, coming around Kolo Point driving and I looked at everything around me and I was praying to God. And I told God, you know, of all the places I could be born, thank you for letting me be born to this beautiful land. <laughs> Eho o ulumai, eho o ulumai. Eho o ulumai kavelina ke aloha. Ake akamai, ake akamai. Everything has changed. Everything has changed in Hawaii. Um, and the reason why it's changed is because impact with, with the outside world was inevitable. And we are um, now responding to the inevitability of our own uh, evolution. Everybody in, the problem is Hawaii doesn't have an immigration policy. The immigration policy, the only immigration policy is the price of housing, which is an immigration policy that blocks its own people. The math doesn't work out 
minimum wage, the cost of housing, um, to the type of assistance you can get. A lot of it is temporary. Um, transitional housing and temporary housing and shelters is always like part of the cycle. Um, there's a lot of things that has happened in Hawaii that um, a lot of our people, they're, they're, they're sick of the cycle. So they're on the land, is that they live in beaches and anywhere they can lay their head, at least it's their own. So when poor families have high housing cost burdens, what we see is they have to cut down expenditures on things like food, educational resources for their children, clothing, and so forth. When folks you know, above the median uh, have high housing cost burdens, because they have the income to do so, they're the ones who essentially vote with their feet, as it were, and leave the places that they can't afford and move to places that have equivalent job markets, but where housing is less expensive. Think of that. They can't live in their own homeland. It's like the Irish when they're pushed out by the potato famine. These are tragic events. And these are tragic events because no one understands that the lack of affordable housing is a political and, and it's a moral crisis, not just an economic one. You guys want to talk about our housing situation? How can you be Hawaiian in Hawaii and be homeless? You are the first people of Hawaii. How has this state gone backwards and our people are the majority of the, hol the housing epidemic? Because it, there's such a great need of our people out there that are on the streets and they're just suffering. They don't have um, family that are stepping in to say, hey, come, you can live with us. Right, especially our elderly population, our kupuna. And if we don't make a change now, who will, right? Who's gonna make the difference? The greatest barrier, of course, is the free market, which puts housing so high that all you can get is a, is a rental unit or a small uh, condominium. What well, we're seeing, um most troublingly is that in places where land is available, and there is there is more land available than I think people people often assume, in places where there is land available, we're seeing a lot of pushback from um, neighbors and community residents, not for the valid reasons around the environment um, or neighborhood preservation or anti-gentrification, but for simply the reason of, I don't want affordable housing, I don't want dense housing, I don't want any kind of housing development to occur near me. And it's important to draw a really distinct line between the good work that people do to avoid displacement of low income communities and the bad work that people do in terms of preserving their own housing values at the expense of low income families um, and even moderate income families who might be interested in living um, in their neighborhoods. As a native Hawaiian, this is my home, but also my homeland. And when I say homeland, I speak about, you know, the land in which your people come from. And, you know, I'm part Chinese and part Scottish Irish. So those are homelands too, but, but I don't worry about China as a homeland. I can always go back there and it'll be, it'll be there. It's culture, language, and food. Same thing with Scotland. But Hawaii, if the Hawaiians don't live in Hawaii, if we don't, if we move out, and we lose our place in Hawaii, we cannot find housing in Hawaii or jobs. This disappears as Hawaii. It won't be Hawaii. Hawaii cannot be Hawaii without Hawaiians. And my approach to that in particular is um, that we really need to first ensure that we're providing Native Hawaiian community with sovereignty and autonomy, and on top of that, provide them with the resources that they need to build and maintain the housing that um, fits that population. I think it's time to change. I think it's time that they give us back land. Let those people stick their hand in the dirt and create. We're not asking you to give us a handout. We are asking what was already ours that was left by a queen. No Hawaiian can take anything and say that is mine. 
was never ours. It was ours to share, to teach. All about knowledge, it was never about ownership. Tomorrow, 20 years from now, for me, I see just a whole bunch of communities where nobody's left out. We don't have homelessness. We don't have people that don't have homes. Even if you don't have a family, don't worry. Because in our heart that we have as a people of Hawaii, we're going to make you come live with us. Because you shouldn't be left out. And, and that's where I see in 20 years, even sooner, um, that will be a great accomplishment for our people. Island. What I see is the only way that Hawaii survives is that it returns to the way the native Hawaiians live, which is a almost a 70% sustainable lifestyle, where you lived in the land along the, the shore, where it was windward, that you went back to farming taro as a basic staple, that you you got off this cargo ship mentality yes. every time. Ooh, I just had a vision. I just saw a community in a big field planting working together. If we can work together, we'll stay together. But we are in need of radical collaboration. And it's time to put Hawaiians back where we want to be. Who I know, our beloved lands are waiting for us to have a relationship. So my vision is to have, and I share this vision with these two wahine nahinahis, is to share uh, intergenerational households again, again, based on the love of land. And when you have the love of land at the center of all that you do, you are in the service of people. Love of land, serve people, same. Love of land, serve people. E ala e kalahi kahi kina, i tamu ana tamu ano ho honu, pi i kaleva kaleva nu u, i kahi kina ayakala, e ala e. There is a sun in the east, it's inevitably going to rise and we are going to help it, we're going to co-collaborate this next evolutionary moment. And it's through um, what we believe, through aloha. Well, that concludes the film portion of the evening. Thanks everyone for viewing along. Um, before I hand it off to attendees for the questions, and just as a reminder, you're um, able to put any questions that you may have into the chat box, and we're gonna try to get to as many as we can. Um, I had a few questions of my own for the, the panelists who are all part of the film. And the first one is this, what are we missing? As you can tell, the film is 10 minutes and only skim the surfaces, uh, skim the surface of the challenges and opportunities faced by Native Hawaiians in housing. These topics are so important to ensuring the well-being of our people, um, but are often not discussed in our politics and policymaking. So I'm curious what the panelists think are other important ideas that are often left out of the housing discussion in Hawaii. So to begin, I'll ask each of the panelists to give a really brief introduction, say how they're involved in housing in Hawaii, and then provide an answer to the question of what you think we're missing. Uh, Kalani, would you like to begin? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so um, the question is, um, what do you think is another, is an important idea that's often left out of the housing discussion in Hawaii? What is not being talked about that you think we should be? And maybe just give a brief uh, introduction as well. Hi, my name is Kailani Mahe'ula. What I believe 
that is being left out. I kind of lived with being a single parent. So basically, we have housing, we have affordable housing, we have places and stuff like that. But for me, I always felt like they should service single parents and you know, elders first. Because like I've been on waiting list for let's say 2013, like seven years. And there's people that live in the housing, they're like, you know, you got mom and dad, two parent household. And so where they can kind of make it work, you know, so like somewhere you gotta build a transitional type where they can move ahead out of housing, you know, like subsidized housing, like maybe a less subsidized housing. You need steps so that people like Kipuna or people who are like single with like multi children, like I have seven children. So for me to be out there working two, three, four jobs just to get by and not being able to get housing is very detrimental, you know? Because once we're on the street, those kids don't belong on the street. So I think they need to move people up, allow people to move, not just allow them to sit in housing for the rest of their lives. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I and I think as for Kipuna and single parents with multi children, they, they got to service us. Mm-hmm. Not for me, but for my children. My children do not belong in the street. That Kipuna does not belong in the street. They're, they're going to be victimized, you know? And that's like just on safety, you know? Mm-hmm. Thanks. Thanks for that. That's a really important around single parents is something that we really don't talk about much. Gerilyn, did you have some have anything to add and give an introduction as well? Well, aloha. my name is Gerilyn Johnston, and uh, thank you so much, Abby, for um, inviting us to be a part of this panel. And um, for me, I'm going to take it from the other standpoint. I want to look at it on the community side. What is our communities doing? And that's really going to be where we're gonna find the greatest success is each person has their hands involved in um, helping the homeless epidemic. You know, it's not only gonna be me or Kai or the other panelists here or you, Abby, it's gonna be our entire islands that are gonna make a big difference in helping this epidemic to be gone. And that's where I feel is, um, you know, everyone wants to see what is everyone else doing, but I think we should all start to look at the mirror and and say, what can I do? You know, even if it's just um, just donating something or being a part of uh, volunteering your time, or of course, you know, investments and stuff like that. But it takes every single person to make a difference in the, the challenge that we have today. In Thank you. Thanks, Gerilyn. That's a really good point. Um, Dr. Dr. Garboden, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me um, in the first place. So I'm uh, I'm Phil Garboden. I am the uh, professor of uh, the HCRC professor of affordable housing here at UH. So I try to serve um, a variety of constituencies around affordable housing issues. Um, in terms of what's left out, um, this is more maybe of a, a next step and how we think about this. You know, I hear a lot of thinking around how can you know u.s housing policies how can sort of american housing policies benefit or inform our approach to hawaiian policies but i think a really important inversion of that is how can we learn from how hawaiians organize land and housing and work and use that to inform u.s housing policies and other forms of housing policies so how can we sort of reverse that learning direction in a way that is uh you know, mutually beneficial um, is, I think, sort of the next step here. Thanks, Phil. Um, Dr. Professor Chang, um, do you like to provide a comment about what um, you think is missing sure. in the housing com- conversation? Um, what's missing from the film, you mean? From the <laughs> For the housing discussion. Oh, the housing discussion. Um, well, I think a big part that's missing, and particularly of, as the Native Hawaiians, is that um, housing is not just a bricks and mortar thing where you put someone into a unit 
that um, the Hawaiians have a very deep you know, association with the land. And so people always ask this question, you want how, oh, Native Hawaiians have a priority in say condominiums at Aloha Stadium. How does that get you close to land? And the question, I, I would answer that question by saying, that's, that's not the answer. That's not the question. Um, the question is that, uh, the, well, the, excuse me, the, what's being left out is that housing is a social marker. Um, people use housing more than jobs to determine um, where you are in society. Um, it's, a, it's, a comp it's a marker of how you're economically doing. If you can afford a house, it means something more than when you rent. So it's a, it's, a, it's a status thing and it affects on the individual and certainly has effects on children. And also housing, I think, it's critical to the way people measure themselves. They don't measure themselves solely in terms of money or wealth. They measure themselves in comparison to others in terms of being able to provide their children with housing in the future. So Native Hawaiians have just as deep a um, sense of the importance of housing, whether it be condominiums, housing, or a farm, or living in a, in a valley. Because the fact is, Hawaiians are slipping away in terms of economics. And that is just so hard to take when your, your nation was taken by the United States. So I would say one of the things to look at is housing is not just about housing. It's an economic and social and political marker that has a lot to do with your sense of identity. Thank you, Professor Chang. That was, that was all very insightful. Um, lastly, I wanted to go to this question for uh, Manu, thank you to introduce yourself. Aloha. Hello. Thank you, Abby. Aloha mai kakoa pao, everyone. Um, Professor Chang, that was, um, you are a philosopher. Um, my work is in indigenous um, epistemology, and um, and so I appreciate the, the uh, hands-on um, approach to policy and the changes necessary to address these issues. Mahalo nui. Um, what's missing in the um, the 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 ten minute uh, video. Um, well, you know, uh, the the you, I appreciate the history, the um, the the succinct summary of the um, of the cultural trauma that um, we have inherited, and um, I appreciate uh, pers uh, Professor Chang's manao on um, the philosophy of how we want to regain our sense of self through connection to land. Uh, sustainability, food, et cetera. So we cannot do that in a condominium. That is true that. So mahalo nui for that. I, I do want to um, add that there is, there is so just, just so you know, um, my work is in critiquing um, systems like ownership. <laughs> you know, do we want ownership or do we want safety? Um, so Krishna Murthy, my one of my favorite philosophers, said, uh, "It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society." So we do not wish to fit in the society. We cannot. I do not want to own a million-dollar home and have a five-thousand-dollar mortgage. That is not my goal. My goal is safety and um, and the ability to serve our our people. And uh, that's where I would like to. Um, to add is that um, the radical collaboration that's inevitable is here today, right now in this in this panel. So mahalo nui. Thank you, Manu. Uh, you brought up so many good good points about self sufficiency and um, about. I think it's a really good transition to the one other question I had before turning to the attendees about what's happening today. Um, the last question I had in the video was. Um, about what our vision was for for the future. And you just mentioned a lot of radical collaboration is already happening today. Um, so for a moment, I kind of want to just turn it to um, what's currently happening and ask you uh, what people, places, or programs give you hope for the, um, give you hope that's happening right now, either in Hawaii or abroad in terms of housing or otherwise. Professor Chang, did you? 
Oh, what's Have happening now? On this one. <laughs> what's happening now is the pandemic, COVID-19, and all the economic chaos that seems to follow, as well as the medical uh, problems. People are out of their homes for that reason. People are going to be evicted, and people are insecure about their 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 place in society. Are they safe? And so I think. Uh, the pandemic actually is going to merge into the next era uh, of, of sort of the evolution of the society, which is artificial intelligence and robotics are going to take away a lot of jobs, just as the pandemic did. And the question will be, how well will Hawaii adopt to a society where we have sort of very high, relatively high unemployment? because of people losing their jobs. Stevedores losing their jobs because of artificial intelligence. People who are carpenters, build, building, uh, building people will lose jobs to uh, machines that can do it faster. A lot of the hospitality industry is gonna be replaced by, you know, basically intelligent sort of receptionists. And Hawaii will adopt if it learns the lessons from the pandemic, which is, that suddenly we have this outpouring of civic and social commitment that just that rises up as sort of a voluntary idea, which comes from where? It comes from sort of the aloha aina spirit, the aloha spirit where I'm gonna help you out, I'm gonna donate food, I'm gonna form something that brings people in. So I think in a way that Hawaiians are really at the forefront of this because they're very good at organization and at laukahi. And I would say this, have you ever been to a baby luau? You see the, the mechanics that go into you know, producing a baby luau, but they do it, Hawaiians do it, we do it just faultlessly. So I think one of the things that can be learned for the future from today is the outpouring of sort of village-like um, cooperation that'll be necessary for the future. Thank you, Professor Chang. I think that's a really good point about how our community cares for each other and how important it is right now. Um, Gerilyn or Kailani, did you have anything to add about any programs or people that give you inspiration currently? Gerilyn, where the mute is on. Okay. Okay. Oh, there we oh. go. So yes, I've been on social media a lot and like, I've been seeing a lot, a lot of help, a lot of kokua from the Hawaiian community, whether it's giving, helping, um, basically, you know, we're in a pandemic, but it taught the people how to share and care and, you know, help each other out again like they're not working so like now they they actually I think it put us all in a category where we all was in need so now everybody figured out okay hey I can give again I have time I can give I can share I can help so I think it kind of put us in a good place but on social media all I'm seeing I'm seeing like the lahui they're planting kalo they have all like they have all these apps and things now that they um they share each other it's color there's different types of color the planting the knowledge i see people like just going out just putting it out there hey if you need help let me know i got food i can help you all the, the food bank like i just i just have been like in total amaze of just how this pandemic had just like it, it taught us how to share care and love and feel each other's traumas and pain again you know so as much as it's it has hurt us it has also helped us as a people and you know i'm like i'm proud i'm very proud of our people right now because they're moving ahead and they're helping and you know they found their heart again a lot of people found their heart again it's not about time and work and themselves and that's fantastic you know for us we're excited to start the kupuna house um, uh, program so that not only works with with the community to help the kupuna get off the streets, but it's also gonna be like um, our fellow panelists said that it's gonna be a community village. You know, it's not only gonna be taking care of the kupuna, but it'll siphon on down all the way to the very youngest child. And for us, 
we've um we have uh just we we know how it is to live in a shelter and we've been there we've done that um and so to be recipients of programs um for us it's it's not only just talking about it but to make sure that we're doing something about it so um we're excited to go on that um venture and we're looking forward to you know, people in the community getting involved, not only in our organization, but also in uh, other organizations, because every single organization out there, as a person that works for IHS right now, um, every organization is important. And every every one of them gives a part of what the homeless person needs, whether it's from shelter or, or funding or um, even food. I mean, and even just to your very own neighbor, right? Just caring enough. So yeah, we're excited about this movement. Thank you, that was really beautiful. I love having that as a motto of share care and love. I think there's a lot a lot in there. Um, Philip, did you, did you have um, anything to add around um, current programs that gave you inspiration? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to find a lot of inspiration in the immediate situation. I mean, I do I do agree that um, as a state, we've done a good job of coming together to support, but the amount of fragility in our system that the, uh, the pandemic has sort of just made so obvious um, is, you know, um, is sort of a harsh reality. You know, what I, when I'm when I'm being optimistic, I hope that what we take away from that is that we can't have a system, a housing system in which you know, a job loss in a household creates this tumbling effect um, so that a family loses their home um, and that we sort of have to, whether it's, you know, a disease, a hurricane, a economic shift one way or another that we need to sort of rebuild a housing system that's much more, um, much more interested in protecting uh, the people who are participating in it. And, and there have been a number of sort of emergent collaborations uh, across a lot of sectors that have come out around housing here. I mean, I hope that the energy sustains past the crisis moment to the like long work of, of real change. Thank you, Philip. Uh, lastly, I'll go to Manu. Um, thank you, Abby. Uh, the answers were very, very um, informative to me. Um, I believe that the, the collaborations are, um, are found in our Olelo no Eao, Ho'e Ho'e Komole, um, return to the spirit and to the strength of family. And um, what, 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 what we've been truncated, what, what we've been cut off from is the idea that um, nuclear families are not a Hawaiian ideal at all. And so our ability to, to, to think in larger numbers um, like um, Professor Chang spoke about in the Luau model, we call uh, that's Awamu Kuleana. Awamu Kuleana is the ability to know the skills, the excellence, and the and the things that people have to offer, and then you just basically allow that to um, to surface. So um, Kai and uh, Kai and um, Jerilyn are absolutely inspiring when they say we we are um, learning to to you know, keep giving in this time. And it is a, it's a big, uh, it's a very vital time, but um, I am grateful for um, the potential of this conflict. And I, and I do want to add, Abby, that when we figure out that state lands or when we're ab able to articulate with aloha in our voice, that, that state lands are ceded lands, that ceded lands are queen crown lands and crown lands are stolen, um, we begin to heal. So the, that kind of collaboration with textbooks that give us, you know, the, the truth of, of our situation here so we can actually begin to heal and, uh, and do this collectively. And that is um, Awamu Kuleana, Collective Transformation Through Individual Excellence. Thank you, Mana. That was, that was really beautiful. I, I, I think thinking about the family and different ways and the nuclear family is is a is a big part of this conversation um i'm going to turn it now to some of the questions we've been getting a lot of feedback from the audience so it might be a little difficult difficult to get to all of it um, but we've been getting quite a few comments about um, some of the 
the issues with Department of Hawaiian Homelands and some people have even provided kind of personal accounts of how long they've been on the waiting list and waiting for um, homesteads. So there's some questions coming up about what are some potential policies or procedures that could be taken um, to, to better either one, um, improve um, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands and um, their ability to provide housing and land to Hawaiian people or even actions outside of that state agency to provide housing to Hawaiian people. Um, Philip, would you like to take, take this one um, about maybe one policy or action that could be taken to improve providing housing? Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think I am uh, have enough information to comment on um, the Hawaiian homelands uh, in anything but a very uninformed way. So I, I won't comment on that. I think the larger issue here in some ways is, um, is about resources, right? And I think we always underestimate um, what resources need to be allocated to make things happen. And oftentimes we're, you know, when we're talking about how do you make stolen lands right? How do you sort of deal with that situation? I think the tendency is always, well, let's do as little as possible, right? So we can sort of check that box, right? And I think we have to move away from that um, as an approach and really say, how much can we give until um, that solution, is, you know, that, that problem is, is resolved. And so I think it's a, it's a shift the state needs to be making in a lot of, a lot of areas, but I think this is one of the, the most significant ones um, that there is there. Thank you, Philip. Um, Professor Chang, did you, did you have anything to add on this in terms of actions by DHHL or the state or otherwise? I did, I did raise my hand, so I do have something to share. <laughs> and that's um, the 100th anniversary of DHHL is no anniversary, no celebration here. And I think everybody thinks of the Hawaiian Homes Program as, oh, it's a housing program, it's a homesteading program. It's just like when they opened up the West to um, the people who wanted to settle it and they ran the Native Americans off the land. No, I don't think that's the proper view of the Native uh, Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. The proper view of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act is it's an apology. It's, a, it's an admission by the United States that what they did in 1893 and 1898 was steal a nation. Uh, and you know, I'm going to talk about my work later, but they didn't even do it right. And they didn't even, they didn't even take the lands correctly. So I'm going to argue you know, in my book that, no, 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 we're not in a situation of being beggars. We're in command. Um, this is an occupied state. But the point I want to make is that this is the end, should be an anniversary about restoration. It should be the rest. In other words, we're celebrating the United States admission in 1921 that it has to give land back to Hawaiians. Why? Oh, not because they're so generous, not because they're people of a good heart. They're people, when you read the, um, the legislative history, uh, they're nasty people. And the only reason they're doing it is because they want some kind of little gesture that makes them feel better after the guilt uh, and the political and moral kind of, uh, you know, the degra degradation of the United States as a nation that would actually take a country, uh, a country of people that are friendly, country without giving them uh, people who won't consent. That's never been in the situation in the United States. The United States has never taken a nation. In the Spanish-American Civil War, they didn't take Spain, they took the colonies of Spain. When they took Hawaii, they took a whole nation. And people forget, oh, they go, yeah, that's, that's nice. You know, they took over Native American, Native Hawaiians. No, they took a nation. What if the United States took Great Britain? Oh, would we feel the same? Like, oh, let's have Great Britain Day. Uh, no, the moral, comp uh, the moral consequences and the political consequences, the legal consequences of what took place led to the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. So it is, a, it is time in the 100th anniversary, not to speak about correcting a land problem, but correcting a political, social, and historical wrong through any means possible. When we think about it as being a land program, we really narrow narrow our expectations. We're giving in to like, oh yeah, well, I mean, what if the Nate, what if that this day was just a party? Oh yeah, let's keep it a party. No, the United 
the United States apologized without being apology. They couldn't do that. They waited, to, they waited for Senate, uh, President Clinton. But today should be the day of recognizing that the United States did something astounding. They created a preference for non-white people, Native, Amer Native Hawaiians. They, the United States has never done that again. A preference, affirmative action program. It really wasn't about going to college or getting land. It was about the United States cannot sit with this moral stain on it, the taking of the nation of Hawaii. Thank you, Professor Chang. Uh, Manu or? Yes, I'd like to comment on that. Because Professor Chang is creating um, the, the actual the substructure for new consciousness to be birthed in Hawaii. My grandfather, um, our grandfather, met my sister Melly's on this. Uh, Noah Webster Lully was, um, uh, was instrumental in writing the Hawaiian Homes Act of 1920-21. And, um, and he started it because he, um, because he noticed the, 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 the Kaumaha uh, in, the early in the early part of the century. He was 17 when he signed the anti-annexation petition we are not colonized, we are occupied. And so that type of truth, you know, the, the steadiness, he had to develop the Pu'uhonua Society that then developed the Hawaiian Homes Act. And he didn't put the 50%, um, you know, that, that is not our way. So the, the, everything about, we, we don't want to improve Department of Hawaiian Homes. We want to have that part of a larger um, system of Pono. And the return to Pono is not going to be, um, um, is not going to be easy, but as volume three of Nanai Kikumu was just launched this week and Auntie Lynette Paglinawan, basically it's coming everybody because she's, she's, they, they are saying very clearly that we are, um, we are survivors of cultural trauma and uh, we're kind of slow, the Hawaiians, we're slow because, we, you know, we haven't called it that. But now once we understand it as cultural trauma, there is a resilience and a response that is driven by our principles. It is a moral discussion, um, and it's and and we cannot wait for um, for people to give us. This is we're not waiting for handouts. So I appreciate the the, the actual truth telling that is on this panel today, Abby, and I appreciate the acumen and the ideas that are coming forward because the new consciousness must be shaped around um, returning returning something that we never ever gave away. Thank you, Manu, for those really powerful words. Um, I, I learned I learned a lot from from everyone and um, from from you and when I was interviewing folks and particularly just rethinking kind of these um, reminding myself of uh, the, how we need to, the structures that we live in, thinking outside of, uh, outside of those. So thank you for always those really powerful reminders. I guess, so we have um, a little bit of, of time left and I thought it might be a, a good way to think about just how we communicate and um, advocate for, for all these things that we've just heard such, um, heard discussed tonight. Um, one of the questions was about um, creative advocacy and they're asking um, how each of the panelists um, advocate for these types of issues in their own lives, whether that be personal or professional. So I thought um, we could end with that that question. Um, Kailani or Gerilyn, um, would you like to take that about how you advocate for these for these issues or how you think would be a better way of advocating? Well, um, you know, I really feel it starts from within. Um, it, it's not something that we can do alone. Uh, you know, we, we have been on this journey for almost a year now, and we're realizing more and more that it's a really big vision. And it's not something that um, one person can do, or even 
all of us is going to take an act of God to change what's going on. And um, we're counting on it, though. And um, it's just that that's the only way I can explain creative advocacy is that each person does its part. I want to share a little bit about how you feel. Um, I think for myself, when I learned the truth, the truth that it was all stolen, it is all illegal. Um, I went through trauma, I went through anger, you know? So I think in my advocacy, I see the, young, the next generation coming up, they're angry because we know the truth. The American government knows the truth. And again, like Auntie Manu said, we never gave it up, you know? And for me, for a long time, I was very bitter. I started lashing out. And I think in my advocacy for everything, not just um, politics, but for the trauma that was caused to our people, I, I just try to bring them back to the light, you know? My, my, what I believe is, you know, we're not gonna overcome evil with evil. We're gonna come overcome evil with good. And, and I go on those boards and I, and I level them out. I'm like, hurt people hurt people, you know? Yes, we have to deal with trauma. Trauma will always be there. This is what I told them. That trauma is not gonna be taken away. It's there, it's, it's, it's deep rooted. But don't let the evil of other people kill your light, kill who we are as a people and what we stand for. And what we stand for as a people is, we're Hawaiians, we, we, we breathe, we live, we sing. Everything is a law from our heart. And like, we are a giving people, we are. But like what Auntie Manu said is, we did not give away our lands. And that is the truth. And like she said, truth, only the truth will heal us, will heal our people. You know, the comment was made like, how much land do we give back? Like how much can we give? You know, I think they gotta go back. Basically I'm waiting, I'm just waiting for the government to do what is right. But in now, right now, my advocacy is don't let them kill your life. Don't let them steal who you are, your love in your heart and who you are as a people, who are the people. Don't let them make us sad, evil, angry. And you know, we have next generation, but for me, I'm waiting for the rights, the wrongs to be right by the government. The government has to do right. They are the leader. They set the standard. They cannot, they cannot live a lie and then persecute everybody under them when it begins with a lie. So advocacy is for people itself. My home, my, my kupuna, my children, live aloha. But always stand by the truth and know the truth. Thank you, Kailani and Gerilyn. I think it's so important, the just the ability to look inward right now and continue to see the light is it's such a big part of this moment. So thank you. Uh, Professor Chang, did you want to make any comments about advocacy? Uh, yes. Um, somebody in the audience suggested going through the legal system. I've gone through the legal system with my attack on ceded lands, and I have been sanctioned over and over again, one time for $78,000 for just saying that they don't own the land. So I just want to answer Manu and Gerald. It's such a passionate the truth is, Geron, we never gave up our lands. We never gave up our sovereignty. Let me ask you this question. Everybody says and believes Hawaii was acquired by a joint resolution. A joint resolution is just a act of Congress. How can the act of one sovereign nation in its Congress take another sovereign nation? Because that nation's sovereign. If the United States could take Hawaii by sovereign, by a general joint resolution. Hawaii could take the United States by a joint resolution. Here's the key. The truth is in 1898, the Senate debate was filled with senators opposing the joint resolution on just this ground. It's impossible because if you believe two things are equal, two nations are equal, one cannot take the other. Hawaii was a nation. That's the key. It wasn't a tribe. It was not indigenous people. It was a nation with, a, with presidents, kings, parliament. It was like Great Britain. You couldn't, you couldn't say in the United States 
Congress. We take Great Britain today. In fact, in the Crown Congress, somebody said, I'll we can take Mo Mexico by passing a joint resolution. And the, the question was, can you take Bermuda too? How about Ireland? And, and he said, oh, only by war. <laughs> yeah, they could have taken Hawaii by war. The United States does not stand by that. The truth is, and it's never took away. So what are they doing here? They're here for sure. It's occupation. The other thing is as to lands, the joint resolution is the document by which all the ceded lands were taken by the United States. So if the document called the joint resolution is inadequate, cannot take the sovereignty of Hawaii, it cannot be a deed. There's no deed, there's no, so ceded lands, yes, wrongfully taken. And I've gone through 30 years of litigation where I've tried the system. Oh, I just got squash in the uh, Hawaii Supreme Court. No, of course they can't admit it. The United States did admit it though in 1988. They said, oh, no, no, no. The last, uh, the last excuse is Hawaii was taken by the Texas means. No, that's not true. The United States Attorney General through his legal counsel admitted this. We don't know how Hawaii was taken. If you don't know how, you don't own it. Because if you don't, if you can't say, I got it, I bought the bicycle, I bought the house, you don't own it. So guess what? It's really as clear as day. The truth is out there. Maybe we've missed it. It's, it's being, it was broadcast in the Senate. The truth is a joint resolution can't take away. So we were, we were, we were taken by some mystical magic some deception, a propaganda campaign uh, that's never been seen before. And, you know, I used to go around thinking, I can't be teaching US law, I gotta be teaching Hawaiian law. Didn't go well in the law school. So things are not gonna go well for a while because we have, we rock the boat like none other. I'm sorry it took so long, Abby. No, that's okay. Thank you, Professor Chang. I'm. I like, I like that as an ending statement to rock the boat. <laughs> um, Philip, did you have any comments about advocacy in your work? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, most of my work is trying to provide sort of data and evidence to advocacy. Um, and it can feel incredibly incremental at times, right? You know, years to change small things and how we do housing policy. Um, but um, I think, you know, in terms of the broader advocacy for me and sort of my position um, is, is also just sort of be positioning myself um, in, as with the service mentality, right? And not always being um, a person who brings information um, through the university and out, right? But to, but to be there as a as a person who serves the community, the Hawaiian community, and you know, the state at large as well. So um, I think that's how I try to approach my advocacy, especially around issues like this one, where um, you know I'm still very much very much a learner. Thanks, Philip. I really appreciated that. Um, well, Manu, um, like to turn it to you to last um, about advocacy in your your own life okay. mahalo um you know it is it is freedom to hear truth you know they're, they're calling this era the post-truth era can you imagine that professor chang the post-truth era that is the people that we has been occupying our lands so um we are in a process of healing advocacy for me is a synonym in my field for mutual emergence and um, we believe that mutual emergence is the only process how we are going to evolve. And that at the center of our mutuality and our mutual causal relationality is aloha. Aloha is the primal source of our collective emergence. It is, it is. And so the craziness that occurred, the, 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 the genesis of our cultural trauma that we now understand more and more and more and more, we are healing ourselves and this is why my two beloveds are here, Kai and Sherilyn. Thank you so much for doing what you do with Kupuna House. That is a, that's just, we are gonna do it um, individually and collectively. And so we, we're, it's almost like we're not waiting. The things that are happening at the Pu'uhonua 
uh, over in Y and I even, I, I saw that in the chat, um, the ability to understand what contiguity means to us. Contiguity is proximity. We are going to be healing through our communities. We are going to be finding our advocacy with our own neighbors. And that is the beginning of a, of a changed relationality and relationship. And that is what Hawaii can give the world because aloha is not our philosophy. It's not a, our religion. It is our culture. So aloha, aloha is our true intelligence. And I, we, we know that and, and, and because our beloved land teaches that. Mahalo. Thank you, Manu. Um, yeah, again, I just, I'm just so inspired listening to you all. And I, I learned so much just in the video and tonight it's, it's really um, just, it's so wonderful to see everyone, you know, not, not waiting for, for guidance, but really just coming together and work, like being the radical collaboration that we're that we're talking about. So thank you everyone who really um, been inspiring to me and I'm I'm excited to continue to to share this video and you know keep keep the conversation moving. So thank you. Um, I could listen to you all night. I wish I, we had more time, uh, but sadly we're at 6 p.m. now. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Connie to um, just give a few remarks before we wrap it up. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, everyone. Professor Chang, Philip, Manu, Gerilyn, Kailani. That was um, really powerful. The video was amazing. And just to hear everyone's convictions and to talk about radical collaboration and making sure that we're all helping one another, that's very powerful. And I think definitely some positives we need to hear today as a reminder that we can work together. Um, Abby, thank you so much for really leading this and spearheading this with Professor Chang. Um, we really appreciate it at Appleseed. She's um, amazing. <laughs> if anyone has any questions or comments that you'd like to submit to our panelists, um, we've had some amazing comments and, and feedback and I'll be sure, we'll be sure to um, give it to our panelists so they can see everything that um, has been going on in the chat box and q a box it was pretty lively tonight <laughs> um, if you have anything else you'd like to share um, feel free to email it to uh, my email uh, connie c-o-n-n-i-e at hi appleseed.org and we'll be sure to um, share this with our panelists um, if you have any other questions um, feel free to email me um, otherwise mahalo thank you so much everyone to our panelists and to our audience for joining good night <laughs>